<clears throat> so thank you very much. Um, as you see, there is a question mark in the title, so I will not uh, really solve the puzzle here, <laughs> but just present it to you and hopefully show that we think that we are maybe close to a solution. So dark matter, as we heard, has a very old history. So uh, the first indications of something missing in, in our basic picture of the universe uh, was discovered by Fritz Zwicky, 1933. So it's really the 18th birthday of, of the dark matter concept. And Fritz Zwicky really introduced the term dark matter. And, uh, I think this is a, a very, uh, it's a quote that shows an enormous intuition of that scientist. Uh, so he noticed that uh, the, the galaxies in the coma cluster move around, of course, more or less randomly. But he measured uh, actu accurately the velocity of the galaxy and showed that they're really moving too fast. They shouldn't be bound. And of course, I, I, the, uh, the coma cluster is, is a galaxy cluster. It is bound. Uh, these 100 galaxies do move together. And there is no tendency that, it's, uh, that something is, is happened. So it's, it's rather calm system. And then one can use really basic physics equations, something called the Virial theorem. Some of you may have heard about it, that one can relate the kinetic energy of a system with the average potential energy. And then he showed that the potential energy has to be very much higher than that given by the gravitational interaction of these galaxies to one another. So he said that <coughs> if this overdensity is confirmed, so he needed some more density of, of matter. And if this overdensity is confirmed, we would arrive at the astonishing conclusion that dark matter is present in, in this cluster with a much greater density than luminous matter. Uh, so he coined the term dark matter or dunkle materia, he wrote actually in German. Uh, in retrospect, one might say that invisible matter could have been a better word because the, the matter that he's speaking about and that I will speak about today is not dark in the sense that it absorbs light. On the contrary, it doesn't absorb any, any light at all, but it doesn't emit light either. So it's really invisible. And just to give an idea, we think in the models I will present later, that in this room, there is in about, uh, well, let's say, in a bottle like this, it's on the average perhaps one particle, or maybe you need 10 bottles of this to, to get one particle. And they move with typical galactic velocities. So through us and through the Earth, and don't interact. So these are a little bit like neutrinos that I, you have may have heard about. But neutrinos, although they have mass, do not have enough mass. So this is not a solution to the dark matter problem. So <clears throat> we will now go through first rather basic uh, observations and basic ideas about how the universe is, uh, uh, is composed. And then we will define the dark matter problem and later I will give uh, an overview of some of the methods that we have to search for dark matter. And at the end it might be a little bit more technical. But in the beginning I think all of you can sort of follow what I, what I say and, and the, the logic in the, in the reasoning that lead us to this astonishing conclusion that Fritz Zwicky uh, mentioned. So that was for galaxy clusters. <coughs> in individual galaxies, there uh, also came rather early. In 1939, Babcock uh, measured the rotation curve of the Andromeda galaxy. So, and this is actually a picture from his paper. So here is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, so he, he had, uh, of course, use of, of the big telescopes that were built in the, in the US in those days. And he just measured how fast do the stars rotate uh, so this is the rotation curve. It's not very easy to see here, so I put here uh, what he measured. So you see that the rotation speed, it, it's sort of zero here, and in this half it goes, uh, let's say, away, and here it moves towards us. 
So that's why you get this sort of characteristic shape. But <coughs> one would expect from the visible matter that the rotation speed would drop because uh, the rotation is really sort of uh, powered by the gravitational binding. And since there are no stars here, the gravitational potential uh, has sort of a, a finite value. And then after that, it should drop like this. But you see he has points uh, that are out here. So there is no indication of, of a drop. And he actually, a little bit like uh, Zwicky, he noted this and he said that so the difference between these two curves can be attributed mainly to the very great mass calculating, calculated uh, in the outer parts of the spiral on the basis of the unexpectedly large circular velocities of these parts. So that the stars really rotate too fast. So you know the centrifugal force would make the stars just disappear. But something is binding them to the galaxy. So it's very similar to Zwicky's um, observation and his analysis. Uh, this has not been so much uh, uh, remembered, one may say, this paper. So uh, there were other observations in the, in the 60s, so much later, uh, and in the 70s, that are more uh, sort of famous today. But really, the dark matter problem was formulated in the 1930s and it could have been sort of taken seriously then, but it, it was not really. I mean, not even Zwicky thought very long about this and he kind of forgot it. And, you know, there were many other enigmas in, in, uh, in, in astrophysics and, and uh, the, the early cosmology in those days. So uh, Zwicky's and Babcock's results were essentially forgotten for 40 years. Uh, but by the end of the 1970s then, and beginning of the 80s, the dark matter problem was uh, realized as a crucial problem of cosmology. And in 1998, as you may <coughs> know, there was an even slightly bigger problem if you look at the energy density, which is the so-called dark energy problem. So we'll come back to that soon. Uh, so how come that this suddenly became uh, so uh, popular in, in the 70s and 80s? Well, I think it was actually due to the Higgs mechanism. And you know, uh, this year's Nobel Prize to, to uh, Angler and Higgs is about that. That there seemed to exist one field, the Higgs field, a scalar field, a spinless field, that can take a... Uh, vacuum expectation value, as it is called. And these ideas were used also in cosmology to something called inflation. So this is a, a potential energy for a Higgs-like particle. It's not exactly the standard, well, it might even be the standard Higgs if you twist a little bit the parameters. But the ideas are certainly similar. That <coughs> So here, uh, this was in, in the earliest universe and this uh, potential energy had a finite value, and it acts then as something called a cosmological constant, which is what Einstein had introduced, and he showed that this really causes a very rapid expansion of the whole universe. Then gradually the field sort of rolls over to its true minimum, which is sort of around here, and in the uh, process of going from here to here, uh, entropy and, and so matter and radiation and so on is, is generated. So this was a very crucial paradigm, the so-called inflationary cosmology paradigm that was born in the, well, around 1980, one may say. So the nature of dark energy and dark matter are questions that are uh, investigated in this field of astroparticle physics that really was created uh, as a scientific field around the uh, 1990s. Okay, so uh, a lot of darkness out there, or invisibility, but what is then visible? Well, with our eyes we see, of course, everything. We see each other, right? And that's because our eyes are sensitive to the electromagnetic uh, radiation emitted by uh, particles in motion, like electrons and you know, atoms, uh, ions, and so on. So that's what Maxwell showed us, that uh, 
light is just electromagnetic uh, radiation of a certain wavelength interval that happens to be visible to our uh, human eyes. And of course, that probably has to do with evolution, that you know, to, to see things, we should have eyes that are adapted to what the sun uh, gives out. And of course, the sun gives <coughs> the, the, it, its peak radiation in the what we call visible spectrum. So if you expand this, it's a really, really tiny interval. So if you expand this, you see all visible lights. So blue, <coughs> green, yellow, red. And for longer wavelengths, you go to the infrared. And then microwaves, radar, radio, and so on. And if you go in the other direction to shorter wavelengths, you get to the ultraviolet. So here, so here it's not visible anymore, but it's still radiation. And you may know that some insects, for instance, they have eyes that are sensitive also to the ultraviolet part. And some other animals can even see the infrared. So it's just, uh, and I think that's very important, that light is just a small part of the spectrum that has uh, wavelengths in, in this uh, sort of 400 to 700 nanometer interval. If you go outside that, it's the same waves, but they are sort of stretched. So longer wavelengths here, and they are compressed here to shorter wavelengths. But it's really one and the same phenomenon. Quite amazing. And this was, of course, sorted out in the early 1900s or late 1800s. Uh, so from the sun, one can measure the, the, the spectrum then that the uh, sun gives out. And one notices all of these uh, colors of the rainbow. Uh, and of course, if you have water drops, you can, these water drops will uh, make this decomposition and that will actually be the rainbow. <coughs> but you also see that there are <coughs> some uh, absorption lines. So these are uh, known lines that don't, where the absor uh, absorption means that there is no uh, light of that very, very particular color coming out from the sun. And that's due to the existence of uh, gas of, of other atoms. So for instance, there's a very uh, strong uh, absorption line uh, due to, to calcium. So calcium vapor uh, in, in the solar atmosphere makes this abs these absorption lines. So if one expands this, and this is a, a, a sort of spectrogram, as the scientists call it, so here one sees the <coughs> relative intensity as a function of this wavelength. So this is for the very sh uh, short interval in, in the uh, uh, blue or, or violet uh, wavelength interval. And you see, <coughs> if you look at uh, the light that comes from a galaxy, that it seems to be composed really of sun-like stars. I mean, that's what shines in a galaxy. So you, you, you recognize all of well, these two dips, for instance. They are really the calcium lines, K and H lines. But all, already here, this is a rather nearby galaxy. Already here you see that's not a perfect match, right? You see this is a little bit displaced. And this is what people looking at in the first big telescopes noticed. And of course, Edwin Hubble was one of those that if you look at more distant galaxies, so this is uh, a more distant galaxy, that's why it sort of looks smaller, it's just further away. But if you look at the light from that galaxy, you see it's redshifted quite a bit. So here are the, the two lines, here is what you measured in the laboratory, and you see that the light from this galaxy is clearly shifted to, to the right hand side, so to, to the red color, right? Uh, and this was a, a very surprising discovery. Uh, and there was already, at, in those days, a, a very good explanation for this. Because Einstein, in his general theory of relativity, he showed that one of the aspects of uh, an expanding universe is that light waves get stretched out. So if the uh, space between galaxies is uh, stretched 
as it can be according to general relativity, because space in some sense is created by you know, the existence of, of matter. So actually space itself can expand. And of course every wave, uh, light wave that travels through space will then sort of be stretched out. And that's really the deep reason for, for the redshift phenomenon in, in the universe. That uh, a wave that starts being blue uh, and, and perhaps travels for sort of billions of years will stretch out and arrive at the Earth being red. It's a very interesting phenomenon. And of course, th th this is the basis really of all cosmology today, that these <coughs> red shifts seem to be uh, explained really by this uh, very clever idea of, of Einstein. Of course, if uh, the, the universe does expand, it also means that uh, the further away from us one galaxy is, the faster away it moves. That's something that one gets just from the expansion. I, I will try to illustrate that, and it depends if this can be seen now on this uh, projector, but let's try. Well, this is, by the way, the, the uh, original figure from Hubble's uh, paper, and of course, it was, it's not a, a perfect straight line, so <laughs> he needs some intuition there. And actually, uh, Le Maitre, the, the Belgian priest, had, had it probably several years earlier. And even the Swedish uh, astronomer Knut Lundmark had it. But he made the mistake of not only fitting this data with a straight line, he also tried a, a um, parabola. And, and that, we know in retrospect, doesn't fit. So, so it, I think it's rightfully still called the, the Hubble law. So, yeah. I, Maybe you see here <coughs> just a set of points that I've generated, pretending, so this is just ran, taking the computer and putting random dots. Uh, each dot represents one galaxy in, in a universe. And of course I could have you know, filled all of this uh, uh, figure with, with point, but uh, uh, we just look at a part of, of the, this toy universe to see what happens. So now, of course, there is this expansion, and how do we uh, picture that using these points? Well, we just, uh, we just stretch it. So what, what I did is just to, to put this in the, uh, well, actually, you can, you can use this with overhead pictures, and taking one picture like this, and then uh, magnifying by you know seven percent or something. I don't. I think it's it's seven percent, and see what happens. So let's do that. Okay. So now you see it's this really the same pattern, but it has been stretched by seven percent. Uh, so what you may say? Well, now we put this on top of each other, and the remarkable thing appears that. So here is the center. And you see very close to the center, I mean, some of these points are displayed by 7%, but it's 7% on a very short distance. So that's a very, very, very tiny distance. Out here, it's 7% on a large distance. So that means that these points have you know, gone quite far away. So that means that the sort of velocity of these points out here is much bigger than the velocity here because here it stays more or less the same, right? But this is because we chose the, this reference point for the expansion. We could have taken a point maybe here, so what would have happened then? Well, we do that. And you see that if we imagine that this is our galaxy now and we look at everything from, from this point, we get the same effect. So, and that's a, an amazing property of our universe that it seemed to be constructed in such a way that all observers in all galaxies in the universe see this Hubble law and everybody thinks that they are at the center of the expansion, right? So, and I think maybe it's even, you know, some lesson in, in life that we all think that we are at the center, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a quite interesting... Um, picture of the universe. 
Now let's take a little trip. So now we go out <coughs> to one of these, well, this is actually the one of the nearest by galaxy, the Andromeda. And that's actually an odd one in, this, uh, in the sense that it's not red shifted, it's actually blue shifted. Because that's so close by that the mutual gravity of the Milky Way and the Andromeda is more important than the tendency of, of the stretching of, of space. Uh, so that's another thing that's uh, important to, to, to realize that locally there are much stronger forces than this stretching because the stretching is, is only seen on really very, very large distances. So for instance, a galaxy like Andromeda will not change its size with time. Uh, what will happen is that both the Milky Way and the Andromeda will keep more or less the same shape. But of course, the, the space around them will stretch out. Actually, in, in the case of Andromeda, due to the, this mutual attraction, means that the Milky Way will sort of merge together and form one big galaxy in five billion years or something. So that will be a spectacular sky, to be sure. But unfortunately, nobody here or our civilization will not be around to, to uh, measure <laughs> this, this uh, very brilliant night sky. But anyway, the idea here uh, that I wanted to make is that, well, first of all, there are galaxies everywhere in the universe. And this one is at a distance of two million light years. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the light has taken two million years to get from there to us. So that means we don't really see the Andromeda, the Andromeda how it looks today. We see it how it looked two million years ago, right? So, and now we can go to a, a, a further away galaxy, and I picked one that happened to have a very interesting event happening 100 million years ago, namely a supernova exploded. But, uh, uh, and, and these are very interesting, I come back to later, because these were used for uh, deducing the contents in, in dark energy of the universe. <coughs> But here the argument is just that we see this galaxy not as it is today, but how it was 100 million years ago. So the further out we look, the more back in time we look. And, and, the, and this is a very powerful idea. And I think the first one who took this sort of to, to the extreme conclusion was Fred Hoyle in the 1940s. So he was one of the first uh, really inventors of the, of the Big Bang model, the first one to really take it seriously. So he knew that in the Big Bang scenario, uh, of course, when uh, actually, so the expansion, if you just take it backwards, so the universe gets bigger and bigger, that means that it was smaller and smaller if you go back in time. So if you go enough, uh, let's say now, well, we know the answer now. So let's say 13.8 billion years. Then you see that everything was completely compressed and, and really infinite density and so on. Actually, we, we hit a singularity that we cannot really uh, describe with physics. But if you just stop a microsecond or, or a nanosecond before that moment, we can perfectly well describe, using the laws we can uh, test in, in laboratories, how the physics was in those days. And, and so Hoyle know, knew all about this. So he knew, let's say he, I think he had a value of perhaps five billion years, but anyway, it's a finite time. So he thought, and maybe we can look at another picture here. So this is as far away that anybody has looked. This is the Hubble Space Telescope looking at one of the, and the same uh, patch of the sky for, for weeks and finding some extremely distant galaxies. So let's see, this one here perhaps is something like 12 billion light years away. So that means we don't see it as it is today, but how it was 12 billion years ago. 
Now, Hoyle's uh, fantastic thought was, well, if we look now 13.8 billion years back, so a little bit further back than, than this guy here, well, then we should see the Big Bang, right? Because the Big Bang was 13.8 billion, billion years ago. And we said that the further out we look, the more back in time we go. And he must have, you know, really been hit by this realization that, well, one should really see the Big Bang. In any direction we look, if you just look 13.8 billion years back, we should see the Big Bang. So how was the Big Bang? Well, of course, it, it was very hot, right? So, and, and how does something that's very hot look? Well, we know the sun, right? Sun has, you know, some few thousand degrees Kelvin. And uh, this he knew, that there should have been a, a stage of the universe when everything was so hot that neither stars nor planet nor anything else made of solid matter could exist. So the, the space was really filled with a plasma, a very compressed plasma. And he could even compute that the, the temperature when uh, in these earliest moments that one could study should have been a few thousand degrees. But we also know from Hubble that space has expanded and the, the light that was sent out and that now reaches us has been stretched out by a factor of a thousand. Also, Hoyle computed that. So he, he estimated that it should be stretched by a factor of a thousand. And maybe we can even go back and see what happens if we stretch light by, by a factor of a thousand. Well, we see here, right? That we, <coughs> instead of visible light, we, we get into the microwave band. So if Hoyle would be right, we should see an extremely intense light, but it's not visible light, it's in the uh, microwave uh, wavelength band. But it should really uh, still be hot in the sense that it can be described by physical laws uh, explaining a, a hot universe. Uh, so, uh, one way to put it is that we usually think of the, the night sky like this. This is a fantastic picture uh, compiled in the 1950s by the same Knut Lundmark, who was one of the discoverers of the universe expansion. So this is, <coughs> you see the Milky Way and you see all the gas and the stars and so on. Uh, and this is what we see because we can, see our eyes is adapted to the light that the sun gives away. So all of these, most of these are, are suns, I mean, uh, stars as we call them, really suns. But if we had, instead of our ordinary eyes, if we had sort of microwave antennas, parabolic antennas as our eyes, then the sky would look something like this. We would be completely blinded by the night sky because there's an extremely intense radiation in the microwave band. And of course, we don't have these eyes, fortunately for us, but we can very easily send up, for instance, a satellite that is sensitive to the microwave. So just have microwave antennas. And we can measure the, the, the pattern of the, this uh, interesting light that was predicted by Gamma. And actually uh, was discovered really by, by chance in the 1960s. And this is a very important uh, field of uh, cosmology these days to really study in detail. So actually, in some sense, this, this is the same picture as this one, just that we have reduced the intensity uh, we have also taken away some uh, emission from the galactic plane that should lie here, as we saw in Knut Lundmark's picture. That's quite easy to do because this is a perfect black body radiation. So that's why it can be extracted from the, the, the night sky and we are not really worried about 
other foregrounds like the, the uh, galactic plane and so on. And these are most probably uh, the extremely tiny, actually uh, when one looks in a picture like this, it looks like these are very big temperature difference because that's, you know, uh, this is a way of uh, visualizing the microwave pattern. We cannot see microwave, microwaves, so therefore if there's somewhat lower temperature, we mark them, uh, those regions with red, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, higher temperature with red and lower temperature with, with blue. But re really these differences of, are of the order of 10 to the minus 5 or something. So, you know, uh, fractions of, of per mille. So really, it's a very, very uniform <coughs> radiation, but there are some inhomogeneities. And it's believed and, and uh, very strongly believed that these inhomogeneities were really the seeds of today's galaxies and, and you know, stars and planets and so on. Because this picture just shows something that was in a state that's really uh, ionized gas. So it's really a, a plasma, but it's just becoming a neutral gas, and that's why photons can get away from that. Um, so we'll, well, this is just a little bit of the history that <coughs> Penzias and Wilson f found this radiation. Then there was a COBE satellite that found these, these fluctuations, but with rather bad resolution. And then, of course, was, well, this uh, uh, W map was in between. And just recently, in the spring, we had this uh, extremely detailed picture from the Planck satellite. So this is a picture that uh, we produced, I think it was when the, uh, Kobe got the, the Nobel Prize. Uh, so Mather and, and Smoot. So, well, we said that in, in this picture of the universe, we can all regard ourselves as being at the center. So here are we at the Earth. Uh, we look back, and of course, when we look back, uh, we receive light, but light that's being gradually stretched out. So here it's very, very short wavelength because this was a very hot period, but on its way to us, the radiation has become microwaves. And in any direction we look, we will just hit this kind of wall around us. And as we said, if we could go really 13.8 billion years back, we should really hit this singularity, the Big Bang. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, we cannot really go back to the Big Bang because in, in this period here, the universe was in this hot <coughs> plasma phase. So light couldn't really travel freely. It was just scattered back and forth. So we have really no information uh, or, uh, from, from light of that. But we really see the so-called surface of last scattering. That is this, you know, more or less 13.8 billion years. Uh, so I think this is a, a rather the interesting way to, to see the universe. We can also see that we are really limited. This is what we call the horizon. So we cannot really see further away than, you know, well, you, even this surface here. But of course, in a few billion years, this would have been, would expand, right? So we will see a bigger region so from this figure alone, it's clear that we don't know now if the universe is infinite or if it is finite because we don't know what's outside our horizon. There is no way that any information, if there is anything here, sort of could have gotten to us because that will need more time to probe these regions. So that is probably something that we will never know if <coughs> the universe is finite or or infinite. Yeah, or this is another Nobel Prize, as we said. Of course, as physicists, we uh, don't look at these extremely nice uh, visual pictures. We do something that's called a, a Fourier an analysis of them. Uh, so this is the Fourier spectrum of these temperature vari variations that you saw from, from Planck. And the amazing thing is that uh, these fluctuations are extremely well fitted by a very simple, uh, actually it's, it, it's a six parameter model, uh, but it fits all of these points. So it, it's very much over constrained and still it fits perfectly. 
And this is something that's called the lambda CDM models. So it's a little bit technical, but lambda is this uh, dark energy. Uh, C stove, stands for cold and DM for dark matter. So dark energy, uh, cold dark matter. That's, that seems to be the main uh, contributors to the energy density. <coughs> so the, the Planck result in, in the spring told us that it's something like 78, uh, sorry, 68% dark energy, 26.8 uh, dark matter. And visible matter that we all think is so important is just a tiny, you know, 5% of, of the average energy density in the universe. Quite amazing uh, and, and really not very well known. Uh, the dark energy might be, uh, well, actually what Einstein himself predicted, but he did sort of withdrew his prediction and even called it one of his greatest blunders. But he realized that if space uh, contains energy, it also contains pressure, but of a very strange kind, because it's, it's, it's negative pressure. And that makes actually this expansion accelerate. So that's perhaps not well known generally, that gravitation has these two aspects. So if you have matter, pieces of matter, they will attract each other. And that's, we, have, we saw Zwicky, for instance, he, he saw that you need more matter to explain the, the, the galaxy clusters. But if you have energy density in the vacuum, that works as repulsive gravity. So then everything moves away from each other. Uh, and and uh, this is extremely surprising. And, and essentially nobody believed this result first when they came. But then there were you know, two groups that measured this. Uh, I, mean, I think I even have a picture here, yeah. With, <coughs> with supernovae as standard candle, one can measure the uh, light intensity as a function of, of, of the redshift. And one gets different uh, behaviors depending on the uh, energy contents of, of the universe. And from this one sees then that one has to have dark energy. So one of these curves at the bottom here is the sort of standard curve without dark energy. And this has then been verified by, by lots of other measurements. Uh, <coughs> so here are three measurements that are nicely consistent and that point out a region here which is roughly this 25% dark matter, maybe 70% dark energy, and this tiny remainder that gives, uh, on the average, a flat universe, it turns out, is this 5% ordinary matter. So <laughs> the three measurements shown here are these, the supernovas, the standard candles, give this sort of bluish uh, cigar-shaped region. Then one can measure the distribution of galaxy, something called the correlation function, what's called the baryon acoustic oscillations, gives this green band. And then the microwave background gives this. And the nice thing is that these are not all parallel. They, they have an inclination with respect to another. And that's why one can get this very tiny region that's, that's allowed by all. And <coughs> there are uh, several other methods that are not as sensitive, but one can test these uh, uh, this astonishing conclusion that, well, actually we have two astonishing conclusions now. We have dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter can be tested by gravitational lensing, which is another one of Einstein's insight that uh, in his theory, one gets a bending of light that's even stronger than in the Newtonian theory. And you may know that this was discovered in, I think, 1919 uh, in, a, um, in an expedition to a, <coughs> a solar eclipse. And, uh, the, uh, and this has since been used very much as, as an astronomical tool because uh, bending by light is proportional to the mass. So if one bends around the sun, one has a very small deflection. But if light is bent around a galaxy, one can, or, or a galaxy cluster, one can get very large deviations. So these are the <coughs> deviations one finds, and it is in perfect agreement with this 
lambda CDM model. And just as an, a, a proof of dark matter, this is a, sort of a 30 standard deviation detection of dark matter. So at these scales, there's absolutely no one, I would say, that really now questions the need for, for dark matter. Uh, it's also at smaller scale that we saw the, the um, rotation curve. So this is another one. That, and, and you may have seen this figure before, but I, I actually made it in a review I wrote uh, some 12 or so years ago. And it's free to use, okay? it's on the internet, so you please use it. Uh, so it's really the idea, same idea as uh, Babcock had, that you show <coughs> the, 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 the galaxy, and then you just show the rotation speed of one of these flanks. And you see that it's really, it's not at all f falling off like it should do if just a luminous matter would contribute. Uh, so that's, and this is a very small galaxy actually, this M33. So the radius here you see is some, you know, three kiloparsecs, which is uh, 9,000 light years. Uh, but this one can actually also have an, uh, uh, an alternative theory of gravity. So one throws away Newton and Einstein and say, well, maybe this is just because gravity behaves differently. And there is something called the Mond theory. And that can actually quite well explain this behavior. But of course, if you go back to, Bab uh, sorry, to Zwicky's discovery, so you look at galaxy clusters, there it, it fails completely. And there is one particular system of, of clusters, two colliding clusters, where one see a, a very distinct difference between the luminous matter, which is the red here in, in uh, X-rays, and this is the ma distribution of mass inferred by gravitational lensing. And you see there's definitely a, a shift in the uh, center of gravity. So you cannot just change gravity and explain this picture. So I think that um, we are more and more uh, sure that uh, dark matter is there and it behaves more or less uh, the same way in both small scales and, and large scales of the universe. So one started to get uh, a picture of galaxies really uh, in the 1970s. So here is a, a spiral galaxy and we just see a, a tiny portion of it. It's really embedded in, in, in a dark halo, it, it's called. So a spherical distribution of, of invisible matter, really. <coughs> uh, so this looks very smooth, but when one started to do uh, supercomputer simulations of a system, starting from the microwave background uh, fluctuations, one didn't really find it. Well, one found this on the average, but a much more interesting uh, pattern, actually. So one saw this uh, filament, as they are called, and whenever these uh, two of these filaments, two or more, cross, one gets a galaxy cluster, a, a galaxy cluster, and our galaxy, our Milky Way, would be some sort of inconspicuous uh, galaxy like this one, for instance, or this one. Uh, so we are not really part of, of a big cluster. But also when one goes to smaller scale, it looks like the, this picture is much too simplified, that one really should have clumps of dark matter in the galactic halo. And this could be the dwarf galaxies that are known to exist. And maybe they could even be completely dark uh, uh, halos, so, so dark, dark galaxies. And of course, one can, in these uh, uh, simulations, one can actually test against observations because nowadays there are many uh, observations <coughs> of the uh, distribution of galaxies. So here, each dot is, is a galaxy. And one is simulation and one is data. And it's actually <laughs> rather difficult to say which is which because on the average, there's absolutely no difference between the actual pattern and the one predicted by the CDM model. So it's, it's, it's quite amazing success of, uh, of the standard, as it is called now, the standard Lambda CDM uh, model. 
so let's see how we are doing with time. Because I, I, I now get close to really to, to the end of the sort of really introductory and, and popular part. Uh, and, and maybe I stop here, we'll see. So, <laughs> so what is dark matter and dark energy? Well, the fact is that no, no one really knows, right? For dark energy, we <coughs> said it could be just the energy density of empty space between the galaxies. And by the way, uh, it, it, that's also kind of intuitively clear why it gives an accelerated universe. Because we said that energy in, the, in empty space acts repulsively. And of course, if space expands even further, well, then there's more empty space, more vacuum, right? And then it's an even greater repulsion. So that means that this builds up and you will get a, a, a really a, an, an exponentially increasing uh, expansion rate. And that is really what happens if, if things are as simple as, as you know, we believe now. Of course, it might be other sort of theories setting in and uh, we don't really know yet. And it will take extremely long before we can, can even figure out what's but it, it seems like that, that it is the uh, empty space energy in between the galaxies that, that drives the accelerated expansion. So that is the dark energy. <coughs> and Einstein called it the cosmological constant, and that's still the simplest idea. So this lambda is a cosmological constant. And all data, I would say, support, <coughs> support that. We have found no deviation from that uh, hypothesis. And dark matter, well, that probably consists of heavy electrically uncharged particles, so-called weakly interacting massive particles. Uh, and maybe they can be detected, well, they have been detected so far, then you would have heard of it, but uh, CERN has, as you may know, has not really uh, come up to its uh, design energy, but it will do so in a couple of years. And that, this will be, of course, very, very exciting to see if they find a particle that can have the, uh, the, the, the properties required by a dark matter candidate. Uh, studies of cosmic rays can also give clues to what's called, well, these weakly interacting massive particles, sometimes called WIMPs uh, models. So we have the Fermi satellite and the ice cube experiment uh, going on. They are both sensitive to uh, these detections and there is uh, also other uh, space experiments and also some uh, uh, ground-based experiments that can search for dark matter annihilation. So dark matter can, if two dark matter particles would, would hit each other, then they would both disappear. That's the strange thing with particle physics, that the energy uh, that's in the mass can be transferred to other particles and radiation. So that could, could be one way to detect them. Uh, and we have seen that with Planck, of course, we get, <coughs> could get even more clues to the nature of the dark matter and the dark energy. And in particular, next year they will present some polarization that will be extremely interesting. That may also tell us if this inflationary uh, paradigm is the, the, the right one. So I will show one more slide here just to show these <coughs> different uh, possibilities to detect dark matter. Well, first of all, we have CERN. This is the ATLAS experiment, <coughs> which is where we are involved in, in Stockholm. Of course, one can find something there, new particle perhaps, but uh, probably if it's dark matter, it's not directly visible because it interacts very weakly. It has to do that, otherwise it would be visible. So it would leave the detector, so that would be missing energy, it's called. But the, with today's particle physics detectors, that uh, is as good as signal as anything. So one could really see if something with, you know, and one can estimate the mass of whatever leaves the detector. But of course, we wouldn't prove that this is a dark matter, because dark matter, the current idea is that dark matter was created in this very, very earliest epoch of the universe. 
because the thermal energies were so high that when two ordinary particles were hitting each other, then the rest mass, you know, mc squared, so two mc squared would produce two of the dark matter particles. Maybe then they would annihilate uh, and disappear, but of course the universe was expanding, so the, there should be a rest population of these very heavy particles if they are stable. So they need to be stable at the, on the time scale of the lifetime of the universe. <coughs> and of course there is no way to prove that in, in an accelerator. So therefore we also have direct detection and indirect detection methods to, to uh, perhaps uh, in conjunction prove the properties of, of the dark matter particle. So direct detection is in principle very sim uh, simple. I said, you know, we had one particle per bottle, right? So we just put a very sensitive uh, crystal perhaps, or maybe a liquid xenon or something like that, and put it deep down in a, a mine that it's not uh, hit by cosmic rays. And then we just wait. Will there be, you know, a, a tiny signal? And there are extremely impressive experiments these days that can really uh, probe this. Uh, deep into the parameter space where they could any, any time actually see a, a, a signal. And then indirect detection is this idea that two particles may annihilate and give particles that there are not so many of in the ordinary uh, cosmic rays. Like this is a, an antiproton, so it's, it's antimatter. Uh, and this is also an antimatter, so it's a positron, not an electron, but a positive electron. And there could also be neutrinos that are difficult to detect, but they have a very striking properties. And of course, gamma rays. And gamma rays at the moment are the most promising ones because they, they, are, very dif they are very easy to detect and they are not absorbed by um, matter and they are not deflected by magnetic fields. Uh, charged particles are a little bit more difficult. Okay, so now I think I will just uh, very rapidly move through here and I will just show a, a couple of pictures. Well, maybe I'll stop by here. That uh, So the Higgs is, of course, a spectacular discovery. So this is a Higgs event. But we are more interested in, in other events where, as we said, something is leaving the detector without a, a, a trace. So these are limits that have been obtained by the ATLAS experiment. So nothing has been seen, so that means that the cross-section has to be lower down than, than these lines. And these are uh, corresponding uh, limits from direct uh, detection experiments. So by, uh, in, in two years, of course, these lines will move down one or two orders of magnitude, and maybe something will eventually be found. So that's, that's of course, very interesting. I will skip through this. Uh, here is the very recent uh, LUX results. So again, this is just the WIMP nucleon cross-section because that's what one can measure. One puts this uh, liquid xenon deep down in, in a mine and one looks at scattering between these WIMP particles, the dark matter candidate, and, and the nucleons. And here one had some previous limits and there were even some uh, claims of, of, of a positive signal, but with this new Lux event, it seems that everything is, is standard and none of these have been confirmed actually. So there is the DAMA and CREST and CDMS and Cogent, all kinds of, of fancy names, but the, the kind of disappointing result uh, in this very beautiful new experiment shows that m most of these were just wrong, I would say. Um, yeah, this is the, the uh, impressive ice cube experiment and of course maybe you should even you know, have a, a, a someone coming and, and presenting that, that uh, because it's, it's, it's a beautiful experiment and it's, uh, it's huge. So this is the Eiffel Tower in comparison. This is in the <coughs> Antarctic, so it, it's three kilometers of ice and <coughs> the uh, volume, the huge volume is instrumented with strings with photomultipliers. So if a, a neutrino passes through, uh, it would, would give uh, Cherenko light that can be detected. So this is something uh, I will just skip through. And uh, let's see, yeah, this was something 
that we really thought, you know, it, it, it uh, looked like and it smelled like dark matter uh, and really a, a, a line, but somehow it uh, was not, well, it didn't survive, I would say, because as time passed, this signal that looks very nice here, it, it sort of decreased and now it's more or less consistent with just noise, I would say. Uh, so we'll not look at that very much. Here is, uh, but, but of course, one needs, as always in science, one needs at least two independent experiments to be really sure if an effect is there or not. So, and the nice thing is that the HESS experiment, <coughs> HESS 2, has this very huge uh, mirror, and that can actually check this line whether it exists, perhaps at a lower level then, but uh, so we checked that, that if it exists, uh, HES2 should get a, a five standard deviation detection after 50 hours of observation. And this is operational now. It did look at the uh, galactic center region for a few months. Uh, they didn't get really 50 hours. So I, I, what I heard is something more like 30 hours. And it's not clear to me whether they will present that data or maybe they will collect also next year. But this will anyway be interesting to see what was this line uh, or this sort of, was it just a fluctuation or, or was it something there? And of course there are space telescopes now being designed that have a much uh, greater energy resolution. So if the lines exist, you should really see them as, as spikes. <coughs> but that's, that's really for the future. So, Conclusions are that <coughs> there have been several experimental dark matter, well, so-called indica indications, but none is particularly convincing at the present time. So that's why there was this question mark in the title, right? We have not really solved yet the enigma. But Fermilat, this uh, large area telescope of Fermi, has competitive limits for uh, low masses. And maybe this strange line here, we will just have to see if it is a real effect or not. And the nice thing is that the field is entering a very interesting period because, as we said, L LAC has been running uh, with full luminosity and soon will uh, run at full energy. LUX has presented this result. There is another uh, even bigger experiment that's being installed at present in the Gran Sasso mine in Italy. And we are awaiting X mass from Japan. They had some problems first, but they, I, I think they will soon come with their first results. And Ice Cube and, and an inset called Deep Core they operate. And Fermi, of course, is the beautiful experiment will collect more data at least five years. Uh, and antimatter will also be pushed further. And we have CTA, uh, this Gamma 400 satellite, and other satellites. So. Uh, a very interesting time, but of course, none of these experiments enter this very interesting region of parameter space where a dark matter signal really could or should be found. But then, <laughs> knowing psychology of, of us humans that do these experiments and interpret them, then you have to be prepared perhaps for false alarms. So we have to stick to the scientific method. That's very important that, you know, we shouldn't believe anything until independent experiments, observations have gotten sort of similar conclusions. And uh, we don't know when that will happen, but I think there are, these are very exciting times for dark matter searches. So thank you. Thank you.